The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community and online store built for engineers and hobbyists alike. Join now and browse the store at element14.com. In the year 2000, Ben Heckendorn built his first mod. We can rebuild it. Smaller. Better. Portable. Since then, he has continued his work, helping those in need with creative new projects. If you've got an idea you'd like to see built, why not send it to The Ben Heck Show? Hello and welcome back to The Ben Heck Show. In today's episode, we're going to be working with Field Programmable Gatorade. Maybe it's Firewire? No. Oh. <clears throat> Field Programmable Gate Arrays. Well, this is embarrassing. You've seen us use microcontrollers many times before on the show. They're good for controlling external devices like a 3D printer or perhaps an Xbox 360 game disc changer. Today we're going to be talking about FPGAs. Those are field programmable gate arrays. We're also going to be using a complex programmable logic device or CPLD. Now these are different than microcontrollers. Now a microcontroller has lines of code much like any other software program. So it's basically like a little computer. It executes the code, it jumps and does things and then an controls the world through its outside pins. But think of it as software. An FPGA is basically hardware that's been programmed. Now let's say you're making some sort of circuit and we require tons of little integrated logic circuits. Instead of wiring those up by hand, you use a computer to basically program what the logic will be. This is your logic device, let's say. And then, it's got all the gates in it, and then you program that to the FPGA, and the FPGA basically is that. So it's not running software, it's actually simulating or actually being a whole bunch of little logic gates that can then influence the outside world. The big difference is this is a lot faster than a microcontroller. So we're going to get started with FPGAs today. I'm going to show you how to install the Quartus 2 suite from Altera so you can you know design on your own and then at the end of the episode we're going to show how the accumulated FPGA knowledge can build something. In this case we're going to be building a dot matrix display, something that you could never do with just a microcontroller. Let's get started. All right, so we've got the um, Altera Max 5 development kit here. Now this is actually a CPLD, a Complex Programmable Logic Device. It's different from an FPGA, but it's along the same lines. So first we're gonna get the software. We're gonna go to Altera's website, go to the Quartus 2 Web Edition Software Service Packs, and uh, download the Windows version. Here are all the packages we can install for. Uh, we don't need all of these. We only need the Max uh, 5, but uh, the Cyclone family would be really useful because as you'll see later on in the episode, there's some stuff we're doing with that. So I'm just gonna install everything, why not? Hard drive space is cheap. All right, we got the software installed, but we need the um, USB blaster drivers. Uh, sometimes uh, Windows or whatever operating system you have will automatically download the drivers for these uh, integrated components, but not always. So I'm gonna go into Device Manager, Update Driver Software, browse my computer for aforementioned software, and go to USB blaster. We now have the Quartus 2 software installed and we're ready to try a test program. So I've got an entry here in uh, VHDL and it's going to be an add or subtractor module. We'll just start with this because it's easy to wire up something that'll demonstrate it in actuality. So we're going to uh, make sure we have the right hardware selected. I believe it's under programmer. Yeah, all right. Let's see, hardware setup. We want to say that we have the USB blaster. That's the interface hardware, not the actual CPLD hardware. So we'll auto detect and we will find our device. There we go. This is a Max 5. Its specific name is 5M570ZF256. At your service, sir. Protocol Droid. All right, so we're going to do this and see if it compiles correctly. Now that it's been compiled, let's take a look at the logic itself before we actually do the physical example. You're going to go to the Netlist viewers, RTL viewer. Okay, now this shows our adder. And what we're going to do is we're going to make this um, simple adder. Now right now it has 16 bits, see that? 15 down to zero. Uh, it's a 16-bit adder, and just to make it easier to wire, we'll make it a 4-bit adder. We'll get to that in a second. So here's our strobes, you know, add or subtract, high or low, clock, you know, actually causes it to function, reset, select. So here are two inputs and our output. So this is actually what the circuit looks like inside of the CPLD. And remember, we're not programming the logic, we're actually creating the logic inside the little chip. It's like if you had, 
you know, th hundreds of integrated circuits and we're, you know, attaching them all together. That's what the FPGA or a CPLD is doing. Okay, so I talked about how I want to reduce the complexity of this just to make it easier to wire up a sample. Here in our VHDL file, we see integer equals 16, okay? That's actually how many bits wide it is. We're going to reduce that to four bits wide. It's also interesting to notice here, well, not interesting, but important to notice that this is um, a physical numbering. It's not zero, one, two, three. It's actually four for four connections. So four actually means it's the adder is gonna go from three to zero now, the number of bit width. We can show you that change in just a second. Now that we've recompiled, we can see that our inputs are different. They've been reduced to four bits, three down to zero. So the next thing to do is to create our pin declarations of pin dependence. <laughs> I just said that. <laughs> so we're going to need, as input outputs, these four to set it up, four input bits, another four input bits, and four output bits. So it's a total of 16 bits. And I wrote down what we need here in a pin configuration that will match up to this. So here's the PDF that tells us what all the connectors are on the development board. Now we need to get 16 bits. So we see, we've got this column here, which is basically just like one of those uh, IDE hard drive connectors from the days of old. And uh, this is called jumper six. So we have jumper six, pin one, jumper six, pin two, jumper six, pin three, and so on. So the important thing that we need to look at is this number over here, the max five COPD device pin number. See, that, that's actually what we have to assign in the pin editor. So if we want these four, one, two, three, four, to be the input, or one of the add you know, input devices, we need to have these pins set. So we'll do that next. Okay, now this is the pin planner. This is where we actually assign what connections go to which actual physical pins on the CPLD. And we talked about our input. So see right here, we've got A3 through zero. And they're set as input, which means they're going to input data, but they don't have a location yet. So we're gonna put that in now. So we're gonna make A3 be the first pin on the upper left. So that's pin one. And our reference tells us on the device, on the CPLD, that's P2. So we go down here and we put that in. I think we can actually just, I think you go pin underscore P2. Okay, we've defined all the pins that we need. And see how they've all lit up on the uh, processor or the CPLD. So now we're ready to program it and then actually wire up our real world demonstration. Now in binary you have your least significant bit here and then your most significant bit here. So this one's always zero. Most significant bit is you know the seventh, uh, 15th, or 31st depending on how many bits your system is. Anyway each one of these is a zero or one but the zero one indicates which number it is. So a six would be let's see one two Four, so it'd be one, one, two. Okay, that's six. This represents one, this represents two, this represents four, this represents uh, eight. So four plus two equals six, plus four. So that's simple because that one right there is four, right? So six plus four in binary, and this is the same thing. It adds, then here it does a carry, and then we get eight, pl eight plus two equals 10. Now let's do it on the circuit. All right, here's the same math problem that we saw on the whiteboard. Six plus four, and then it equals 10. And here's it in binary. Here's our CPLD. Uh, we've got all these wires hooked up to our pin definitions. See, here's bank A, and we've got the four bits, and bank B. And right now, these resistors are pulling those pins low. So to make them high, or a one, we need to plug them into this breadboard. So we're going to reproduce this math problem. All right, so there's A1, that's a bit. Okay, and then A2 is a bit. That will represent the number six. Plug it in, okay, those two are high. On B, we just need one. B0, one, two, okay, B2, which will represent the number four. Okay, now the circuit's ready to go. And uh, over here, this is going to be the output. And again, we have the binary and decimal uh, decoding here. So let's see what the answer is. Two plus eight, 10. All right, cool, we did it. You can also do subtraction too. If you reset it, we'll hold down, add, subtract, so it'll do the opposite, it'll subtract, clock it, and it should give us a result of two. Yep, there it is. All right, cool, we got the CPLD working with our test program, so now it's time to try something more advanced. If you're like most people, you enjoy being recognized for your abilities and your hard-earned achievements. Well, prepare to be rewarded with Element 14's new badges and ranking system. Here's mine. 
It's designed exclusively to reward active members of Element14.com's engineering community. Each of the 11 new badges is based on the founders of electronics, from Cologne and Volta to Hertz and Kid Teal. Your badge represents your ranking in the community and is visible to all members. Learn about all badges, ranking, and how to earn points in the experts area at element14.com forward slash experts. You can also nominate someone you would like to see recognized as an expert in the field of electronics or apply to become an expert yourself and have a chance to be featured on the Element 14 homepage. Earn points towards your next badge by participating in the Element14.com community. Replying to posts, creating new blogs, and answering questions will all earn you points towards your next achievement. So join Element14.com and start collaborating with other engineers today. And now, back to the show. All right, so we showed you an example using VHDL. Now we're going to show you an example using a slightly different programming language for these circuits called Verilog. Verilog is a little bit more conversational than VHDL and it looks more like a structured language like C. So we're going to start by making a module called a heck and then the input output on this is going to be clock, data out, and select. All right. Now we need to say what each one of these wires are. So input wire is a clock, that's just one wire. Input wire select is, well, you'll see what it does in a second. And then the output, which is going to be the result of whatever we're doing, output register, we'll call that, oh wait, I'm gonna make, let's make it four bits wide again, so three down to zero, and that's going to be data out. So what we're gonna do here is we're just gonna make, basically set up a little simple state machine that when you clock high by pushing the clock button, it will do one of two things. If you're pushing the select button, it'll show you one value. If you don't, aren't pushing the select button, it'll show you a different value. In a normal program, you know, you'd say, you know, X equals 15, but in this one, you have to actually set the width of the register bit. So if you've got a four bit value, you actually have to declare it as a, you know, three, two, one, zero, like you have to declare the four bits here before you could actually have the value. So state one will be a four bit uh, value. We're also going to have state two. Those will be the two different things that show up when you push the button. And then finally, we'll have, I don't know if we're going to use this, but we'll have zero, which will be uh, what will happen when nothing's going on. Okay, now we're going to initialize it. Initial. <laughs> now see how, you don't have to use tabs, but uh, it makes it look better. So I'm tabbing it. Okay, so state one is basically going to give it a constant, and that's going to be four bits wide, and then we do this, this, and then we give it its declaration, 1100, okay? And the next one's gonna be state two, and we're going to make it four bits wide, but it's gonna be 0011, so we can see a difference. And then zero, I don't know, if, I still don't know if we're gonna use it, but whatever. Zero is going to be, get this, zero. Okay, and that's the end of that statement. Okay, now we're going to do our actual always on logic. Now, you need to keep in mind that with the FPGAs or CPLDs, it's not like a conditional flow program like a microcontroller or your computer would have. It's like designing the circuit so a lot of it's always running. You know, it's always. So we're gonna use the always statement. Your favorite Steven Spielberg movie. So in this case, always at the positive edge of the clock line, do this, begin. And then here's where we can do kind of our conversational logic. If select line equals one, if it's high, make data out, which was the data line, make that equal to state one. So that'll be 1100. Zero, zero. If it's um, zero, of course we could also use an else statement here, data out equals state two. Okay, and then end module, that's the end of our module. All right, let's see if this compiles. Okay, now we're looking at the RTL, the register transfer level of um, what we designed. So we kind of wrote this like a conversational language. This is a description of what we wanted the circuit to do. And then when you compile it, it figures out exactly what logic will accomplish what you want it to do. So it selected um, two multiplexers and a flip-flop here for our output register. So we have the select line coming in, the clock line coming in. Uh, here's where it selects what it's going to do. Here's a flip-flop to store the output. And there's actually what shows up on the lights. So now let's do a demonstration. All right, we're gonna use the same test switches as before, because why not? We've wired up the clock and select lines. Now our logic said, if positive edge of clock, so if I push this button, it's going to pull clock high. And um, there's a well, difference between things being high and low. There can also be a positive edge, which means the transition from low to high is a positive edge trigger. So this is going to have a positive edge trigger. 
So if I push clock, we'd select untrust, which means zero, it'll be state two. Okay, and then I can release the buttons and we have that flip-flop, which is a memory, so it's storing the result. And then the other way this can work is if clock goes high with select pushed, it'll go to the other state. There we go, see the other lights light up. So that's a very basic idea of what you can do with a CPLD or an FPGA. In our next step, we're going to take a more advanced design that was done by the Longhorn engineer over the last couple months and show you what FPGAs are really good at. Now, a couple of episodes you saw us build a super alarm clock. And the first thing we tried with the alarm clock was making a dot matrix display. We got it working, but it wasn't working that well. It was kind of dim. Now, the reason for that was because we were using a microcontroller. The program was going through the motion, sending out the data and uh, matrixing it, but it wasn't fast enough. So that's really where an FPGA or a CPLD comes in handy. Here you see we've got a Cyclone 2. This is also made by Altera. And it's another development board. And it's been plugged right into this, which is our new DMD display for pinball. Now this unit has been built by Parker Dillman, the Longhorn engineer. And uh, we uh, kind of teamed up on this and uh, he put it together. But this is gonna be a great example of what an FPGA is good at. All right, well, we went on the internet and found a picture of a cute kitten, so we're going to make this a bitmap that can run on our display. I don't know if this is the best image. I'm going to pick a better one. Okay, I think this kitten image might work a little better. So I've got this program here that will do the conversion for us, so we just need to change the file name. Let's see if this works. Oh, <gasps> cute! Okay, so we've got this uh, microcontroller here, which is actually sending the data to the FPGA. Now, the beauty of the FPGA in this case is it's actually doing this all, these lights aren't all on at the same time. They're actually, you know, multiplexing very quickly and you can't see it. And, but the FPGA is fast enough that you can actually cycle some of the lights at a lower frequency to make the dimmer colors. And that's actually how any LED display that you, you see works. The light brightness is actually done by pulse width modulation by pulsing these dots at a slower frequency than those dots, you get a different brightness. So, a microcontroller unit wouldn't be able to pulse this fast enough, not even close to fast enough to do this. But with the FPGA, which simulates, or actually is, you know, actual physical logic, it can do that very quickly. So this can just send, this thing can actually be off. See, I reset it. And this has already got the data that just keeps pulsing it out until this updates it. So then we've shown how to get started using an Altera FPGA or CPLD. And here we've demonstrated, for instance, the advantage of an FPGA over a microcontroller unit. Although here we've actually got them working in beautiful harmony. So in the future, you might want to think about using an FPGA instead of a microcontroller in your design if you need more speed and less computational power. And certainly here on the Ben Heck Show, we will consider them in the future as well. That's all the time we have for today. In our next episode, we're going to be helping someone in need with a specialized game interface just in time for the holiday season. We'll see you then. Stay tuned at element14.com forward slash TBHS where you can join the discussion, suggest builds for the show, and even have a chance to win upcoming builds. Remember, you can always email build ideas to benheck at element14.com. Thanks for watching.